Lab. This is, I think, our um, fourth session. And oh, fifth, is it fifth session? I, I've lost track. Um, but today's speaker is His Grace Mahatma Prabhu. He is a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, and he just recently had his 50th anniversary of his first initiation um, a few months ago. So he has been practicing Bhakti Yoga for many years. He was also a teacher at the Vrindavan Institute for Higher Education for Bhakti Shastri and other courses. So he's well versed in the Ishapanishad, and um, we're very fortunate to have him here with us. And I hope you brought your questions. Okay, so I hand you over to Mahatma Prabhu. So what's the schedule? Um, we have one hour? Um, we have, a, well, officially one hour, but we can go a bit over if people, you know, ha have more questions or if there are a few points you want to make. What time should uh, I end speaking? Or we want to ask um, questions while I'm speaking? Um... Well, we can do it however you want. I mean, we want if you want to do the overview and then ask questions, or do you want people to ask questions as you go along? I'd like it when I ask questions as I go along. Okay, so yeah, we can do that. And then we can see, um, yeah, I mean, I think most important is if you have more time, if you want to, uh, you know, continue speaking for a little bit, we can also do that. Um, but yeah, if people want to ask questions along the way, then they can do that. Yeah. So... Why don't you hit, uh, Corinna Shakti, you have to hit the record button. Okay. Yeah, it's a recording. I see the, the recording um, signal oh, okay. is on. Okay, good. All right. Okay, yeah, so, so um, everyone, if you want to ask the question, you can, um, you know, either post it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and, you know, just ask the question as well. You know, say your name and, yeah, you can ask the question. Okay. So this is a book club. Yes. So, and discuss. Um, yeah. So every day we um, we have like a Zoom or a WhatsApp call with a few few devotees, and everyone would have read the verse beforehand, and then okay. we discuss what stood out for us and um, a, a answer any questions that anyone may have. And so then every few verses we have a summary lecture. Um, by a guest speaker. So we've had um, Bhakti Vinod Swami from Vrindavan, Lakshmi Moni Mataji, um, Atul Krishna Prabhu as well. Um, Urmila Mataji is giving the next summary and um, we haven't finalized the, the next speaker after that, but that will be the last one. Okay, so the best place to start with these verses is with definitions of knowledge and ignorance because these verses are talking about vidya and avidya and so the spiritual definition of knowledge and the material definition of knowledge are different if you've read these verses and purports you can see that basically the way Prabhupada is defining knowledge is that anything that helps you get out of the material world is knowledge and anything that keeps you in the material world is ignorance that's a you know, that's kind of the context otherwise if you don't understand that then you can misunderstand why is Prabhupada saying this is ignorance or why is he saying this isn't knowledge so that's one of the the means that come and that's really that's really one of the main themes of everything that Prabhupada has written and everything that he taught that your the end result of your knowledge the end result of your advancement is that you take another body so that then translates into ignorance so it may be knowledge relatively in terms of um, collecting information in terms of technological advancement in terms of education preparing you with knowledge and skills for the world but from this definition from this standpoint if the knowledge you have results in keeping you here so you take another birth then it's ignorance so that's that's the basic content um, the, the another point Prabhupada's making is that so-called knowledge 
or thinking you know when you don't is worse than ignorance. So what does he mean by that? Well, let's say we're going somewhere. Okay, you're in South Africa, so we're gonna go from Durban to Job. No, that's too easy, Durban to Joburg. We're gonna go where Karuna Shakti lives. What's the name of the place you live? I forgot. Um, Newcastle. Yeah, we're gonna go from Durban to Newcastle. That's not so straightforward, right? So you ask me how to get there. And I say, well, I think you go this way and this way, and I give you all wrong directions. It would be better if I just told you, I don't know how to go there. You're safer with me telling you I don't know, right? Than me giving you the wrong directions. So Prabhupada's saying, if you think you know something, but you don't, it's dangerous. I had, a, I had a philosophy professor. He must have been teaching philosophy for 10 years or so. And when we came to class, he, the first thing he said is, I don't know anything. So he was honest. That was his conclusion from teaching philosophy for so many years. Uh, and so that's, that's honesty, to say you don't know something. So Prabhupada's saying, to think you know something is dangerous because it misguides people. One time, Prabhupada met a professor of Hinduism, and he said to the professor, what is Hinduism? And the professor said, well, that's difficult to answer. And Prabhupada said, you're a professor of Hinduism, and you can't tell me what is Hinduism. And he turned to one of his disciples. It was kind of like a, almost like a setup. And he turned to his disciple and said, Mr. So-and-so is a professor of Hinduism, but he he can't tell me what is Hinduism, but he's teaching Hinduism. What is that? What is that? How do we understand? What does that make him? And the disciple said, Srila Prabhupada, that makes him a cheater. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, he called you a cheater. <laughs> Are you going to accept that? The Prabhupada was like playing with this man. But he was making the same point that... Uh, you don't have a right to teach if you don't know what you're teaching. And, uh, and it's especially dangerous if you're telling people this is how to get somewhere and you're not 100% sure that's how to get there, and then you're cheating them. Now, I have experience of this in China. As you may know, China has not had a lot of religious history, at least recently, and especially during communist time. So many, many devotees you will meet, you'll say, what were you before you were a devotee? They said, I was nothing. I didn't have religion, there was no God. I didn't know about God, it wasn't even spoken. And of course, there's a lot of Buddhists and also not so much God. And it was so interesting because in preaching in China, you don't have to deal with people who have all kinds of crazy ideas of God. For many people, they never even heard the word God, or even thought, or they, they never thought of God. It was not part of their life, their vocabulary, their world. Isn't that interesting? For us in the West, we don't, you know, they're atheists, but they're not a lot. But in China, there's a lot of atheists. And what I found, in teaching them was very refreshing because you're teaching people who know nothing about God and it's much easier to teach them than someone who thinks they know something about God, isn't it? And Sri the Prabhupada gave that example, there's a music school. And if you, it's, it's actually a school that teaches piano and they have two prices. <laughs> One, if you know how to play the piano, and two, if you don't know how to play the piano, two prices, right? So then you would think, oh, if I know how to play, it's going to be easier, so the price will be cheaper. And it turns out to be the opposite. And if you know how to play, they charge you more because they have to teach you. They have to unteach what you learn because, you, because their method is different, so they're pretty certain you've learned the wrong way or a different method. So they have to unteach you. 
Um, Hare Krishna, there is a, a, a question in the chat. Can you see the chat or would you like me to read okay. the question? I'll, I'll open the chat and then I can keep going. Okay. No, I didn't see that. You're actually saying that almost all the totality of what we're taught is wrong. Is it getting us to the wrong direction? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, what we call knowledge. Okay, let me let me give you the exact words of my was it physics teacher. This is such a this statement struck with me. This is 1968, so that's 52 years ago. I'm sitting in my physics class. And the physics teacher, he, he begins the class by giving us the history of physics, of what the great phys physics, they're not physicians, the great scientists have discovered over time. This one had this theory, then that was proven wrong, then this theory, that was proven wrong, then this theory, that was proven wrong. And he's, he's going through the history <laughs> of the various theories. And then he says, he was honest, and this was like, this like hit me. I was not that interested in school, I thought. It kind of felt like there's more to know than what I'm gonna get out of this university, and I don't think anyone in this university knows what I need to know. And then he has the punchline. He was just being honest, and he said, and this is what we know today, or this is what we accept today, and probably in the future it will be disproven. And I'm sitting there thinking, why am I wasting my time here <laughs> learning theories that are later going to be disproven? I've, I've also heard that if you're a professor and you take a hiatus for a while, in certain science, sciences, you, when you come back, you're not qualified to teach anymore because new information has shown that what you learned was not entirely correct. So that's one point. It's, you know, the Prabhupada makes, okay, you're limited, it's speculative. So what, what you taught sometimes, what you learned in university definitely is wrong. There's no question. It was, it was proven to be false, new discoveries, or it, there was some politics behind it that um, there are theories that are being maintained and accommodations have to feed into those theories with their research. And if those, their research doesn't feed into those theories, they could lose their job. Do you, you know that one lady had made some discovery that would turn evolutionary theory on its head? And she, they said, uh, they threatened her life if she was gonna publish it. And she went ahead and published it and she was fired. She wasn't killed, but she was fired. So yeah, in some cases, what you are taught is deliberately wrong, not accidentally or not. This is what we know now. But Prabhupada's point is, is not really what is right and what isn't right. Um, but it's, where does that knowledge lead to? So you have this verse in the uh, fifth canto of Bhagavatam, Guru Nasasyat, Swajani Nasasyat, Pita Nasasyat, Swajani Nasasyat. Guru, don't be a guru, don't be a teacher, don't be a parent, pita, don't be a relative, don't be a leader, unless you liberate your dependence, that's your qualification, that I, through my knowledge, I can get you out of the cycle of birth and death, and then I'm qualified to be your teacher or your parent, whatever. So that's the idea. That's the idea that, that's the context in which Prabhupada uses the word knowledge and ignorance. So sometimes, what do I say? Sometimes Prabhupada calls people fools and rascals. And you're thinking, this person is, Prabhupada's calling a very intelligent person a rascal. So I, I coined a term, intelligent fools. I was listening to an atheist. There's a famous atheist, I forget his name, he's English. Looks quite like a, quite a, if you see him, if you just look at his face, he looks quite miserable, actually. Probably be happier eating prasadam and chanting Hare Krishna, but he's an avowed atheist and he's an intellectual. So he's, he's up there in the IQ, era. you know, he's high in the IQ area. But the arguments he gives are foolish. 
And so what you learn from this, and you also learn from Prabhupada, is that someone may be very intelligent materially, but spiritually, if there's nothing there, knock, 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 nobody's home. Knock, knock, materially, yeah, he could run circles around you, you know, with his arguments and philosophy. But the thing is, they're stupid arguments, but they're very intellectual, if you know what I mean. So some people don't have the capacity for understanding. Now, then, then Prabhupada talks, okay, you have the people in ignorance, who are giving you knowledge but don't know, like mis misleading you, so-called spiritual teachers or politicians, whatever. And then you have just the outright atheists. There's like none of, none of this exists. This is all. Um, and Prabhupada makes the point in some of these purports, he said, if you draw the logical conclusion, you can see how the advancement of material knowledge in so many areas leads to atheism. Isn't that? Have you noticed that? This is like to all of you, not just Anne. Have you noticed that the more we progress in knowledge, the more there's a tendency to think there is no God or no need for God or some kind of impersonal God? That's where it leads. That's where a lot of knowledge leads into that. At least in the, the world of science, we've seen that. What, what we've seen is that the premise of scientists who don't believe in God is that God was a crutch at a time in history when we didn't have enough scientific knowledge to understand how the universe was created and maintained. But now we understand how it was created through evolution. And therefore, the need to cling to a God for an explanation of how the world was created and how it's maintained isn't necessary. It was only necessary as long as we lack the scientific knowledge. So now that we lack the, the sci now that we have the scientific knowledge, we can just get rid of religion. It, it doesn't have a function anymore. It only had a function as a, as a place card until we figured everything out. We figured it out. So you can just, you know, close all the churches. It's, it's, it's all ignorance. We don't need, we don't need you anymore. So that's, that was the conclusion of the scientific community. Well, not maybe not all, but many uh, who became advocates of evolution based on chance combination of chemicals. Consciousness does not exist as soul. It exists as chemicals. The universe happens by chance through evolution. And, you know, when you think about that, there's nothing about that that makes any sense whatsoever. And that's like now the cutting edge of science is very interesting. I don't know. I, I used to think these things were stupid even before I was a devotee. And Prabhupada start, started pointing it out. I was, yes, yes, I see that. So is education bad? Is knowledge bad? No. But this, is, this discussion is not about going to college and getting education so you can uh, get a job or, 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 or find, find something to do with your life. This is about what's going on in the guise of knowledge. Yeah. So my professor was honest. He knew he didn't know anything. Okay. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions at this point. So I did have to go breeze through a little bit of these purports to make sure that I didn't forget anything. But um, Prabhupada makes a point here. And it's just like, it's just, Prabhupada's words are, you know, they are what they are. And it, 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 you know the word raw? You know, we, I don't know if you use this word in South Africa, you know, but if someone's like very basic in what they do, it's, it's very raw. His music's raw, his art is raw. He's a raw person, he's straightforward. So Prabhupada is the raw, the, the raw of the rawest. The rawest, no, no, excuse me. He's the rawest of the raw. He's just, 
he's just telling it like it is. So what does he say here? Yeah. People who are engaged in sense grat gross sense gratification, according to Gita, are asses. So what is he saying? He's saying, you have this beautiful civilization, what probably called the motor car civilization. In, in India, back in the time of Yudhisthira, it was the elephant civilization. They didn't have motor cars, they had elephants. Hastinapur, the, the place of elephants. Now it's automobile. So, so now you have cars, nice roads, nice this and nice that. And Prabhupada said, so you're working like an ass to get these things, to, to maintain these things. So you call it advancement, but from the spiritual perspective, you're just going down in your next life. So your buildings are going up and you're going down. Although Prabhupada said, uh, so-and-so built this building, you know, penthouse. To a, he's got his apartment and he doesn't know in his next life, he's gonna be a cockroach in that apartment. So what about that? You know, he's a great scholar, a great engineer, and he built a building or whatever. And the result of that, and he worked very hard throughout his life. And the result of that, he became a cockroach in his next life. Of course, they don't believe that. But if that is true, which it is, then everything starts to make sense. The so-called learned people are foolish. I mean, they may be nice people. We don't have nothing against them, but we're talking philosophy here. And Prabhupada, when he talks philosophy, he's just, he's raw. It's just, this is how it is. This is, this is ignorance and this is what people are engaged in. So that's what he's been focusing on. Um, Hmm. Um, I, Krishna, I, um, I was just saying, I, I had some questions that from our book club. So um, just as you're speaking, I'm trying to bring them up. I was thinking, um, one of the questions that you're talking about, um, foolish, um, the foolish intelligent. And uh, I mean, in Mantra 9, Prabhupada makes the point of the Veda Vata Rata. Uh, um, yeah. Veda Vada, Vada Rata of uh, people who pose themselves as learned in the Vedic literatures. So, I mean, the question was, um, okay, it's easy to spot the materialistic um, teachers and professors, but how do we discern when we see so-called spiritualists who appear to be knowledgeable um, and teaching some spiritual practice, but it's, um, it's actually nescience? Because any, well, there are different ways but particularly the Veda Vataratas, they just, you know, they wanna improve their material lives through study of the Vedas, which is unfortunate because the ultimate purpose of the Vedas is to know Krishna and to go back to Krishna. And then you use the very literature that is meant to get you out of the world, to keep you in the world, just maybe in a better position in your next life. So I think one of the most common misuses of spiritual knowledge is to use it, to apply it to, for material purposes, to, to upgrade so your material existence. In a quick sense, upgrade means upgrade in your next life, maybe even to another planet. So that's one misuse. The other misuse that Prabhupada talks about here is the, is the Mayavad philosophy, that I'll, I'll use this philosophy to become God. And the interesting thing about the Mayavad philosophy, is I'm God, you're God, we're all God, there is no God. <laughs> the way Prabhupada says it, he said, this is the last snare of Maya, because the people who adopt this philosophy, at least theoretically, have renounced the world. But in the name of spirituality, they've adopted the same mentality of the materialist. They just, they're just doing it in a different way. So it looks spiritual. But what's behind all that? I want to become God. I mean, I don't even think Donald Trump wants to become God, although that's questionable. But at least not, not overtly, consciously trying to become God. He maybe wants to be a little God in his own right, you know, the Trump empire, the Trump dynasty. But 
actually trying to become God himself, that's like off the charts for materialists, isn't it? Even you want to be like powerful and great. You could say, oh yeah, he's competing with God. But when it comes down to it, not exactly. But the Mayavadis want to be God. So Prabhupada's saying, even though in the garb of renunciation, their motive and desire is exactly the same, if not worse, than the materialists. So, and you know, we've seen so, so many immoral actions done in the name of religion. So using God for your self, that's another example. And, and you know what's interesting? In, in bhakti, we don't care where you are on the spiritual map. You can be very renounced, not very renounced, very strong spiritually, not very strong spiritually. But what Krishna cares is about the relationship your affection, your devotion. That's what he cares about. You may have so many desires, but if, if you serve Krishna, not to fulfill those desires, but to please him, he's very happy. It doesn't matter that you have so many desires. So the, the thing that is, is we are trying to avoid is using Krishna to, to, to fulfill my desires. That's kind of the very, very outskirts of spiritual life. It's way on the edge. And the more, more you go in, then I'm going to draw a picture for you. Then the more you get closer. I just have to find some scratch paper, which I have somewhere here. I believe, hold on. Don't leave South Africa. I'll be right back with what I need. Okay, it's time for a lesson, everyone. This is my new flip chart. And this was from exercise in a course that you didn't take, that you should take, but that's another discussion. So we draw a circle. We'll draw three circles. Okay. Okay, children, circle one, circle two, circle three. There are three, you got that? Okay, this is the material world. Um, this is material life. What does material life look like? I'm gonna draw it. So what I draw, I draw arrows. The arrows indicate everything that a conditioned soul would like to enjoy material facilities, prestige, and so forth. And what is in the center? Take a guess. Who can guess? What's in the center if this is material life? Not what's in the center. Who's in the center? Who can guess? Who's in the center? Who do you think's in the center? Oh, it's in the chat. You can also. Can you unmute yourself? Me, yes. She got it right. <laughs> Rasika's in the center. Okay, we have to draw a picture of Rasika. Um, this is a, you can, if you ever want to explain to people the difference between material life, religious life, and spiritual life, you can use this. This graph was created in the fertile imagination of my brain. But I think illustrations offer often are the best way to explain something. Sometimes you have the right illustration, you don't have to say much. Okay, so I'm not an artist, so please excuse me, even though my father was. Okay. Who's in the middle? You are. This is the material world. I want everything. For who? For number one. Who's number one? Numero uno? It's me. Can you see? Are you reading everything backwards? This says material. No, it, 
It looks it, it looks correct from from here. What? It looks correct. Yeah, it oh, looks okay. good. Yeah, okay. So that's material life. Right? You agree? Raise your hand if you agree. Yes. Yes, we all agree. Excellent okay. drawing. My father was an artist, you know, so it didn't rub off on me. I can try to draw a little better. Now I have to draw Krishna. I have to draw two people, and you're going to have to tell which one's Krishna and which one isn't. <laughs> okay. To draw some lotus eyes. That's a giveaway, right? And beautiful hair and playing a flute. Okay. I didn't do a good job. You're probably going to laugh, but they call this primitive art, right? In some countries, it has its place. Okay. Religious life. Who's in the center? Two people. One is you and one is Krishna. So why is that religious life? What does that mean? Say, still, I want everything, right? But if I get him in the center, he'll help me get everything. So that's better than trying on my own. Better than the stupid atheist thinks they'll get it themselves. Or a materialist, I'm not so stupid. I go to church and I pray to him to give me things. So that's pious or religious life, generally as we know it, or as it has become. It's not really religious in the ultimate sense. But, you know, the dharmic life, do your dharma, you'll get, you'll get things. Who do you think is in the last one? The last one is spiritual. Who do you think is in the middle? Take a guess. Krishna. 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 Unless, you're from Unless you're from Vrindavan, well, then it's Radharani. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I should have both of them in there. Huh? Lotus. I don't do justice to uh, Krishna's beautiful. Are you going to go? Oh, he looks more beautiful than that. All right, it's Krishna. Looks like I gave him a mustache or something. Well, I'm going to advance my drawing skills a little bit. All right, anyway. Anyway, as I said, the disclaimer, I'm not an artist. Okay, so let's summarize. Material life, we're in the center, we want everything. Religious, pious life, we bring Krishna in the center because he can help us get everything. And, oh, in spiritual, we're outside. We're, we're outside and we're, we're also throwing things, we're outside and we're throwing things in the center because Krishna is now in the center and so we're helping push everything in the center. I don't know how we got on this discussion. How did we get on this discussion? What was the catalyst for this discussion? I forgot. Um, we were talking about how um, people, uh, the Veda Vata Rata and how they used spiritual knowledge. Exactly, yeah. So, um, the, what Prabhupada used to say is that if you are going to worship God to get something material, you're basically be doing offering things, going to temple, praying, offering the lamp, chanting some mantra. You could do that to become liberated. That would be better. It's, it's like the same energy. It's like an investment. Same amount of money, different results. Okay, we have another question or no? You know, I think we can move from there. Okay. Um, the Veda Vata Rata people. <laughs> so then Prabhupada said, yeah. Then, okay, enough for the Veda Vata Ratas. Now we're going to the Maya Parita Gyanas. These are the ones that think they're God. Or, they're, um, or they'll worship somebody as God, ordinary man. Maya, Aparita Jnana, means their knowledge is stolen or covered by Maya. So 
they fall again into the, the class of intelligent fools. Um, one of the things you see, you probably noticed this, that you see in Kali Yuga is, is some people just don't know how to think. Have you noticed that? Like the atmosphere is such, the culture is such, the religious teachings are such that for some people, it's like these simple truths. There's like, there's nowhere, there's nowhere it registers in their mind. And that's another aspect of knowledge being stolen by Maya. Maya just like doesn't allow them, doesn't allow them to understand. So, so Prabhupada was so adamant on distributing his books because he understood, he could see that you have, well, you have uh, so many ignorant people that if they understood these things, at least they have a chance. At one time, Prabhupada, I think he was on a morning walk and he was, he was describing all these so-called leaders and scholars who, who just ruined India with their so-called knowledge, just diverted people. Yeah, these people were highly respected in India. And Prabhupada is, boom, boom, he ruined India. He ruined this, he ruined the Vedic culture. He ruined this philosophy, he ruined, but then Prabhupada stopped and he said, you know, probably I'm the first person who's ever criticized these people. And you, you might say, well, why was he so critical? Because it's through pure bhakti that we get out of the world. And when Prabhupada would see that people, innocent people are being misled, very upset, very upset. It really angered him tremendously because <clears throat> he had so much compassion for people that it just really hurt him to see how people were being misguided. Innocent people being misguided. That was also why Prabhupada really pushed book distribution. Give people a chance. Maybe they won't read the book, but at least they have a chance to read it. Right? It'll be there, you know, when things get bad and they have nothing to do and they're locked up in their home. You hear what's happening in America now, in Los Angeles? Yeah, that was that was actually one of the questions we wanted to bring up because, um, you know, when we were reading uh, Mantra Ten and the, you know, Prabhupada lists the items of spiritual knowledge, and we were yeah. talking about tolerance in the, you know, in the face of provocation and, yeah. you know, not being um, distressed, you know, um, and not causing anxiety to others, and you know. Uh, one of the, the main points that people, someone brought up was the current state in America and the, the very blatant um, racism and the violence. And the question was, how do we actually apply these principles that Prabhupada's te uh, asking of us? Because it seems impossible in the situation. Yeah. Well, when Prabhupada says be tolerant, he doesn't, he doesn't mean that we tolerate in a way that other people suffer and we just look by and say, well, I'm just supposed to tolerate it. Yeah, go shoot him, you know, I'll tolerate it. <laughs> it's not like that. So, you know, I think it's a con the context and, and application have to be understood. You know? So in here, when Prabhupada's talking about tolerance, generally, you know, he's talking about tolerating your mother-in-law, right? Isn't that what he's talking about? He's talking about, Tolerating other living entities like mosquitoes and do you have mosquitoes over there? You have them, right? Oh, and an abundance. Yeah, we have we have things. I don't even know what they are, but they like to eat me. So, so he's talking about the adi bhotik, adi daivik, adi atmic. You know the the agitation of the mind, nature, other living entities, and so. Yeah, you know, we have to tolerate ourselves. Sometimes we drive ourselves crazy, right? So we have to control our minds so we don't end up in the mental hospital or something, depressing ourselves. And then we, we allow other people to disturb us. So we have to tolerate rather than lash back at them. And nature, of course, we're seeing with coronavirus and it's totally out of our control. So generally when Prabhupada's talking about tolerance, He's talking about that and, and of course tolerating our senses, tolerating our passions. 
when you take it into a broader context of the world, then we could see that, that Prabhupada, there were a lot of things he couldn't tolerate, such as the, the criticism of Krishna and his devotees. Uh, very difficult when Prabhupada saw influential people cheating in the name of knowledge. It was very upsetting. There's a lecture, I don't know if you've seen it, Prabhupada was in India, and he was screaming. He was screaming, why do you have to take birth? Why do you have to die? Why do you have to get old? Why do you have to get diseased? These questions, these are the real problems. And I was like, wow. And what I was feeling when he was saying that was, he was just like, he was like, look it, nobody's telling you this. They're all telling you the problem is you don't have enough money or you're not in this career and you know, all this advice you're going to get, which is fine for, pra for practical in the practical world. But they're telling you like, this is like the ultimate, you know, succeed materially. And it was like, it was like he was, it was like he was yelling at the people who were, who were guiding people away from thinking or seeing what the real problems are. So that level, the devotee is intolerant, intolerant of actions that cause suffering for others. I don't know if that's what if that answers your question, or was there another aspect to it? I mean, it definitely helps. Um, you know, so if we're saying don't be tolerant of um, the suffering of others, how would we, you know, how should we respond in these kinds of um, drastic situations? Like if um, innocent people are being, well, you know, it, it all depends on what you can do. We, we just had a situation, not we, but Devotees in Chile, in South America, just if you, if you take a flight from South Africa and go east and a little south, you'll end up in Chile. And there's big riots in Chile because the government, I think, has raised the prices on transportation and the economy is like horrible. And so some devotees were saying, should we participate? And should we not? It was a dilemma. And you know, my there's always this this thought in my head where Prabhupada would say, you know, don't bother yourself with what's going on in this world. So there's always that, you know, if if I put my head into this, this is unjust, should I go out and march or what should I do? It could take you away from your Krishna consciousness. And by helping people become Krishna conscious, it's a better solution. So those things are to be considered. And personally, I can just tell you personally what I do. When I see the injustices in the world, I just become more inspired to educate people in Krishna consciousness because I know that's gonna solve those problems. So I use those things as inspiration. And knowing that if people were more Krishna conscious, this particular problem wouldn't be there. If I go out and try to solve the problem, Maybe I can do a little bit, but then the question is, is that really what Prabhupada wants us to do? I mean, you know, why not go out and blow up all the or abortion clinics? You know, go into the slaughterhouse and let the cows free at night. I mean, where does it end, you know? So, you, you know, Prabhupada preached, you know, we should not kill animals, especially cows, but he didn't tell us to go set them free. So I think our real weapon against this is knowledge. Um, personally, of course, as devotees, when we hear these things, we feel compassion for abused people. We think, but then the, the big question is, what can we actually do? What's most effective? What's in line with what Prabhupada would want us to do? And how will that affect us? It wasn't that, you know, and also the other thing is, as part of a religious organization, if we get involved in politics, it could be very problematic for us in some places. You know, so we may have to not at least overtly be involved in, in siding with one party or another. But what, what is the specific question? Is there a specific situation? Like, is it the situation in America that people are looking at? Thinking- Yeah, it was, the, it was the situation in America that specifically people are talking about. That is, um, you know, but, but if you look at the problem, if you look at the problem, 
you know, racism. What's the cause of racism? It's, it's a lack of spirituality. What's the cause of prejudice? Right? I'm the body. You're Indian, you're black, I'm white. So I think a lot has to do with our own vision of people. Like, how do we see people? How do we deal with them personally? So this thing going on in America, um, you know, racism is deeply embedded in the psyche of so many Americans. You know, I lived in South Africa during apartheid. And when I came back to America, I was like, I never saw America that way. And I realized the difference between America and South Africa, at least on one level, is that there were similarities. The black people lived in certain neighborhoods, not as bad. And of course, they had more potential for up word mobility, but not so much, not when I was young. Opportunities for education, they had more than in South Africa at that time, but not as much as the white people. Job, everything was less for the black people. Still, even in, in many cases, it's not as widespread, but still, those problems are there. So I came back to America and I, and I said, oh my Govinda, we have apartheid in America. It's just unofficial. It's it's, it's apartheid within people's consciousness, within their heart. I lived in an all-white neighborhood, vanilla. As far as the eye could see, it was vanilla. It wasn't, there was no apartheid, but there were no African-Americans living there. And nobody would sell their home to an African-American because the neighbors would shoot them. The real estate value went down. The neighborhood's going to be dangerous. You know, all these ideas that they had. So I think that's just like South Africa. It's the same thing. Not as bad. But we had a lady come to our house every week when I was growing up as a kid. Guess what color she was? She cleaned the house. Take a guess what color she was. Right. Not white. Not Mexican. Black. So unofficial. So I think the real problem for us as devotees is getting rid of, it's not so much what we do externally as much as getting rid of the, the prejudice within our own hearts. And we're all, I don't know how, I can't say for you, but I could say as an American, living in an all white neighborhood, that in itself just ingrains some prejudice in you that, well, we're better. My school, I think of it one, one African-American devotee in our school, in the entire school, like high school, like 3,000 that I remember. Maybe because he was a friend, maybe I don't know the others, but I don't remember. So how do you think that affects us? Right? It has some effect, for sure. So I would, I would tend to answer this question in terms of look at your own prejudice, look at, you know, look at your own heart, and then what can you do as a person to improve yourself and what can you do in your environment around you to at least not treat people the way they're being treated in america and these are deep prejudices that are ingrained well, I mean, deeply ingrained it's even ingrained in african-american people did you know that even they have some of the prejudice against african-americans that the white people do it's that deeply ingrained did you know that? No. No. I hadn't yeah. thought about that. Yeah. Well, there's there's something on YouTube somewhere. And they have dolls, Barbie dolls, or some kind of dolls. And one doll is white and one doll is black. And they'd ask these kids, what doll do you like more? And they'd say, I like the white one. And say, why? Because he's white or she's white. I'm like, OK. And then. They asked the black girl and you're thinking, okay, well, this is the black girl. She's not going to give the answer. She had the same exact answer. Which one do you like? I like the white one. Why do you like the white one? Because he's white. White's better. So even the, you know, I say, I'm not prejudiced. You know, even the black people have it. So we all have some prejudice. It's one of the qualifications for getting material body, right? Um, there's a question in the chat um, you yeah. mentioned in terms of tolerance. I think on each one of these 18 points, you could give like an entire day seminar on totally. each one. 
one. Um, Tell me which one you want. Yeah, question: Tolerate our passions. So there's another question somewhere, or what? Did you, you mentioned add? in the chat. You mentioned uh, we have to tolerate our passions. How do we do that? Yeah. I was just reading this morning. We were just reading in today's class, Lakshmi. Really nice point. Lord Vishnu went to take rest and he told Jai and Vijay, don't let anyone disturb me. Lord Vishnu has to take rest, okay. Anyway, Lord Vishnu went to take his afternoon nap. Okay, whatever he does is all for Leela. And he told Jai and Vijay, don't let anybody disturb me. So then Lakshmi comes and Jai and Vijay said, you can't see. You can't see Vishnu, Narayan. What do you mean I'm Lakshmi? So she got really upset. But what's interesting is it said because she's Lakshmi, a cultured woman, she did not express it. But she later told Vishnu that she felt that was improper behavior. So she didn't lash out at Jai and Vijay. Who do you think you are? I'm Lakshmi. You're just the servants here. How dare you treat me like that? So I think it's important to understand that there are two things. One thing is how you feel on an emotional level. And the other thing is what you do. And I think a lot of us think that how I feel and what I do has to be the same. If I'm angry, then I yell at somebody. And so <laughs> for a lot of us, it's hard to think, okay, I'm angry, but I'll be not angry. But what was explained here is that this is culture. You know, like there's a, there's a way to act, there's a way to behave. So even though I'm upset, I work within the culture, right? So it, it's nice to think like that. So what's the culture of a relationship, for example, respect. So even though I'm upset with someone, out of respect, I won't express that. Or if I express that upset, I'll express it at the right time and place, but not in an upset way, in a peaceful way. Not an angry way, I won't yell and so forth. So that's important if you can if you can of course i could see someone saying okay that sounds good how do you do that and i could just keep explaining and always get the question okay that's good but then how do you do that so um oh it's also in italy whoa so i think it's very important to understand because as conditioned souls, we're going to respond to situations. Sometimes we're going to feel very upset or, or whatever, feel jealous, feel envious, lusty, greedy. And we want to learn how to, so to speak, massage that emotion into something which is guided by etiquette and maybe massage it into sattva guna so that I could process it better. Otherwise, if, if we're acting solely on our feelings when we shouldn't be acting on certain feelings, then it's like, it's like we're devotees, but we're not acting like devotees. We're just, you know, we're doing what everybody does. That's what everybody does. And, and maybe some people who aren't devotees are better at controlling their emotions than we are. And so that's, I find that kind of embarrassing, actually. Uh, we have so much facility. So that's where that begins. You know, just, just, under, just understanding that. I think a lot of us don't understand that that's possible, that we don't have to act on how we feel. So, you know, think like that. Uh, uh, I, I feel this way, but I'm trying to cultivate sattva guna, I'm trying to cultivate bhakti, and, and a person trying to cultivate bhakti wouldn't act the way I feel like acting, wouldn't say the way uh, what I feel like I should say now. So that's one, that's one point. Second point is, which relates to this point. Um, it's a, uh, sorry, I just wanted to, um, it's uh, it's five to seven now, so I just want to ask if you have, uh, you know, if you uh, can stay a bit longer, and if um, 
the uh, devotees listening, if you can stay a bit longer as well, because um, we haven't gone into mantra 11 yet. <laughs> so does anyone object to just going a bit more over time? No, no. All, also overnight, if it's possible. Thank you. Mantra 10 will take... Mantra 10 will take 10 weeks to finish. Respect. Be, uh, don't work for name and fame. Don't put others in anxiety. Be tolerant. Avoid duplicity. Uh, search out a guru. Follow principles. Live your life according to scripture. Refrain from practices detrimental to the interest of self-realization. That's a big one. In Kali Yuga, that's a really hard one to follow. Because if you're an ordinary person, practically everything you do is detrimental. And if you get influenced by the society, there's so many things we do that are, we don't even know they're detrimental. We're so used to doing them. And they're, I, I, was, uh, I just did a daily video, it'll come out, I don't know when, a week or so, about how influence we are by what we see and hear and touch and taste and who we associate with. And a lot of these influences are completely subtle. We don't even know we're being influenced by it. If you just look at who you are and how you act, it's not entirely just your DNA. It's social conditioning. And so we're very influenced. And we're living in Kali Yuga. So that we should be careful. We should be more aware of the influences around us. Um, don't think you're the body. That takes a while to realize. Um, be aware that you're getting old. That's easy. Just look in the mirror. Um, do you know the joke? This guy makes a deal with God, you know, before I die. Please warn me. And then he dies and goes to heaven. And he said, God, you never warned me. He said, yeah, I did. I said, where? You never warned me I was getting off. He said, yeah, didn't you see the wrinkles? Didn't you see the gray hair? What about your aching bones? That was all warnings. You didn't notice. So yeah, Krishna says, observe the signs of, you know, observe the miseries, old age, disease, and death. Yeah, sometimes we don't notice. We don't want to. Uh, once you not be happy or distressed over desirables and undesirables, in other words, be equal, equal posed. Don't be pulled around like a yo-yo. Um, don't be attached to more than you need. Don't be too attached to your family beyond what it would be detrimental. Too little attachment would be detrimental. Too much would be detrimental. Um, become an unalloyed devotee. Okay, start working on that. Um, live with devotees in a spiritual environment. Become philosophical, yeah. Um, I'll tell you a story about becoming philosophical. Then we'll go to verse 11. This is a lot to cover in one hour. I was giving class in Bangalore two months ago on Usapanishad. I sometimes go two hours on one verse. So, um, what was the last point I made? I was going to tell a story. Philosopher, yeah. So I had the great fortune of being born in Los Angeles and also being in the temple. And what was the great fortune of that? That was where Prabhupada spent most of his time in America. So one day, I think it was Tarikram Swami came out uh, in the evening. He had just been with Prabhupada. In, Anytime you'd meet a god brother or god sister who had just been with Prabhupada, what do you think you would do? You'd say, Hi, well, Prabhu, nice to see you, and walk away. No. You'd run up to them, grab their neck, and say, Tell me, what did Prabhupada say? Tell me, don't go. No, you wouldn't grab their neck, but you would ask them what Prabhupada said. He said, Prabhupada said, We should all be philosophers. You should always be talking philosophy. So that's very important. Uh, very important. Always be talking philosophy. Very, very important. That's, that's what we're doing, analyzing philosophy. Yesterday, my daughter and I were talking philosophy because she read something that was really difficult to understand. And we were talking like 20 minutes trying to understand it. And then our heads exploded. And then we stopped talking about it. But that was a good explosion. 
exploding with philosophy that was like it's the, the Purusha avatars, Karana Dakshai Vishnu, Shura Dakshai Vishnu government. He said, they're, a, they're affected by Maya. They're attached to Maya. Whoa, we were discussing that. So, but, but, you know, what does Prabhupada mean? I'm looking this up. And so it's kind of the whole time you're just absorbed in the spiritual world because you're talking philosophy and you're seeing the world through philosophy. So that's important. Okay, should we take questions before we go to 11? Yes, actually, um, Ra uh, there is a question from the group. Um, Radha, you wanna ask your question? Okay. Yeah, I actually have two questions. It was regarding what you were talking about earlier about the situation in the world right now. So, um, from- Who's asking your question? Radha Vinod. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, okay, from a spiritual perspective, yes, we can use this as an opportunity to preach that we aren't the body, et cetera, et cetera. And, that, and in that way, we can help. But like materialistically, um, is it really possible to solve all of these problems? Because we are living in the material world and naturally these things are going to be there. So are they really going to get solved? Well, you know what one thing Prabhupada said, which is so interesting as a, as a general point, as an answer to your question, is I think it was 1%. I'm not sure. I believe it was 1%. He said 1% of the world become Krishna conscious. It would, it would create a, you know, like you have, right? 1%. You just get 1%, it'll throw it off. That one percent is so heavy. It'll it'll turn the tides. You can make so that's you know you become Krishna conscious. You make other people Krishna conscious. Of course, that's the best thing you can do. There may be some situations where just you, well. Here's an interesting point. This is I'm glad you brought this up because this is really interesting. Now, Radhavi knows. If you read the first canto of Bhagavatam, Prabhupada's talking all about society and misleaders and how innocent people suffer and you know. and all of those things that he's talking about all those concerns have never been concerns that he told us to take care of independently you know like animals are being slaughtered like i said go to the slaughterhouse you know let the animals free and blow up the slaughterhouse and that'll be our sankirtan you know program for the next year's go you know, at night, blow up all the abortion clinics and so forth. He, but he preached against those things and how people are suffering and animals are suffering and how this should be stopped. So what it means is that in the, in the establishment of ISKCON, he was establishing a Brahminical society, a society for people who would be teachers. But when he's commenting on those parts of Bhagavatam, he's putting on a different hat. He's putting on the hat of a chatriya. Like, if we were in charge or we had influence in the government, these are the things we would be doing. So I think it depends on the hat you're wearing. And if you're wearing the Brahminical hat, then no, not so much. You would do it through knowledge. If you're wearing the chatriya hat, then this becomes now your duty. You are now responsible for the welfare, material welfare of people. So a lot of those purports, Prabhupada's talking about the material welfare of people. It's interesting because he always told us, you know, don't, don't bother with material welfare. And there he talks about innocent people suffering at the hands of misleaders and, you know, prices rising and food shortages and all these things. I mean, you could say he, he's saying ultimately the solution is be Krishna conscious. But at the same time, when you wear the hat of Chatriya, now it's your duty to make sure your citizens, the, the people under you, are taken care of materially, emotionally, and spiritually. So I think that's important to remember. Although it may not be a, a priority of ISKCON per se, it wasn't that Prabhupada didn't think about those things. It wasn't. You know this story? Oh, it's an interesting story. Just to add a little, it won't answer your question directly, but indirectly it will add some spice to it. Prabhupada was walking in a park 
near downtown and about 6 30 in the morning people were parking their cars near the park the prophet said where are they going he said well they're all going to work but it's too expensive to park downtown so they come early and they park here and they take a bus or walk or whatever the prophet said but it's so early going to work so early and Shruti Kirti Prabhu said he could see tears coming out of Prabhupada's eyes, that he was actually crying. But he said, and he was saying, Prabhupada was saying, these people are working so hard. He felt, he really felt bad. So it's not that we don't feel these things, but it's, it's like, well, what, what is Prabhupada going to do about the fact that people are working so hard other than teach them? But he did say in the Bhagavatam, you shouldn't work more than eight hours a day. So if we were you know, creating our own <clears throat> government, <clears throat> then we would say, you know, it's illegal to work more than eight hours a day. You know, in South Africa, it was like that you know, during the apartheid. Did you know? Do you know the history? Do I know more of the history of South Africa than you do? Do you know that? Do all the stores closed at five o'clock and they were all closed at one o'clock on Saturday and Sunday all day. Did you know that? Raise your hand if you knew that, of course. Make a noise if you knew that. And I asked the devotee, he said, why? Why? He said, because they want people to be home with their families. They want people to go to church on Sunday. Isn't that interesting? So, we're in charge of the government. Okay. Can't work on Sunday. Go to the temple. Everything closed at one o'clock. I don't know if we do that, but Prabhupada said eight hours of work. And that was, they didn't want people. It was, I mean, it was fantastic. We had an evening program every night. You couldn't go do anything at night. There's absolutely nothing to do. You had to be home. What are you going to do? You can't go shopping. You can't get anything done. Everything's closed. There was no online shopping. So it was good. So that's my answer, Radhavi. You know, it's, it's both things are going on. But we definitely... We could definitely say, by if you read the first canto, you could definitely see Prabhupada was concerned about people suffering at the hands of misleaders and miseducators. Definitely concerned. And, uh, if we were in the role of Chatriya, our strategy would incorporate more of the practical things that, that in ISKCON we don't do. We do some of them, but not a lot. I mean, you could if you wanted to. I mean, you could have a you could, you could start an orphanage if you wanted and then make them all devotees. Feed people prasad. You know, you can do these things if you want. You can, you know, collect cows that are going to be slaughtered, buy them and take care of them. So that's part of it. I don't know if that answered your question completely, but. Yeah, no, definitely. That's very interesting. Um, I think it's nice that uh, it, it incorporates being uh, compassionate as a devotee because you obviously don't want harm to others so if it's a part of your job for example if you're a lawyer or something you can still go on and fight and do your duty for justice yeah um, but at the yeah. same time be krishna conscious and also distribute spiritual literature um definitely yeah. are you a lawyer oh sorry i had another question if you don't okay mind. okay um, the second question is also regarding this stuff, but um, in terms of the invocation to Sri Ishupanishad, it's talking about how because the world is an emanation from the Supreme, it's perfect and complete. And uh, it, so is this world a perfect in the sense that because it's the material world, these bad things have to happen and that's what makes it perfect because that's the purpose of the material world? To, like anxiety to make us suffer. To make <laughs> it's perfectly suited to make you go crazy and want to go back to Krishna. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> that's one of the purposes. I, I never read the Upanishad in that context. I always read it in that it was like it was self-sufficient. You know, it's like within itself. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't need anything. But it's also, now that you brought this up, it's such a good point. It's also perfectly designed to make you go completely insane if if you allow yourself um, to open your eyes and that put you know keep the curtain over your eyes 
insane in such a way <clears throat> that you will say, okay, I can't deal with it. I, uh, that's it. I'm going to become Christian conscious. So it, it also has that function. And, um, it, and I, always, I always say, you know, all these problems in the world and all the things we have to tolerate and, and all the suffering we go to, through, I say, you know, it's actually good. We need all this. You know, this is what detaches us. This is what helps us in our spiritual life. If everything is just perfect, then the impetus for being Krishna conscious is not so strong. Do you know, I don't know if you know this, this is more the unknown truths of South Africa. Do you know? That when I was there during apartheid, very, very, very difficult to interest white South Africans in Krishna consciousness and very difficult to keep them once they're interested because their lives were too nice. Do you know what Johannesburg looked like in the 1980s? It looked like Beverly Hills. Like, like two thirds of Johannesburg or three quarters looked like Beverly Hills. As you know, you may know, like they had, I don't know about now, but they had more swimming, swimming pools per capita than any place in the three worlds. It was just, the, the white people were, you know, it was the next best thing to Brahma Loka. And they, it was so hard for them to become devotees. And after I left South Africa, I went to, I went to merry old England. It was, I think I got there in December. So in December, the sun was rising at eight o'clock and setting at 3.30. And basically, I don't think I saw the sun for the four months I was there. As Prabhupada joked, the British said, the sun never sets on the British Empire. And Prabhupada joked, he said, yeah, it never rises in London. So, so many people were becoming devotees. There was no money there. So many people were not working. So many people were squatting in apartments. They had no money. So that was my personal experience. You know, it was one right after the other. So now you see in South Africa, so many white South Africans are becoming devotees, isn't it? Their lifestyle is much different than it was, we're talking now, what, 40 years ago? That's before most of you were born, yeah. So this is all like history to you. This is firsthand. Don't believe your history books, just believe what I say, because I saw this. Yeah. So thank you for that question, that's good. The world's perfect, and it's also perfect place. To, well, well, I'll say one other thing rather than those. This planet is, not only is the material world a good place to launch back to the spiritual world, this planet is the perfect planet to launch. And the reason is because there's not so much suffering here that you go crazy. And there's not so much enjoyment here that you go crazy. It's kind of balanced. Where in hell, it's like there's, if you go lower planets, there's too much suffering. It's hard to think about Krishna consciousness if you're just thinking about how to eat. On the higher planets, it's too nice. You don't really need Krishna consciousness. Everything's just fine the way it is. So here, it's not too good and not too bad. So it's, this is the place. You are fortunate. We are all fortunate. We're in the right place at the right time. Take advantage. Okay. Wow. So it's just like a happy medium in which we're existing. Say that um, again. I said I think it's just like a happy medium in which we're existing. Um, yeah. I guess it also brings us back to the point that it helps us to understand that we need to learn uh, nescience alongside with the spiritual uh, and Vedic knowledge to help us kind of understand it better. Yeah, well, always when, you, always when you're learning what's true, it's always important to learn what isn't true, to clarify, to make things clear. And it's also important to learn how to utilize everything. So, you know, some, something is nescience or darkness. Well, that depends also how it's used, right? Um, what's, Chris, what's Prabhupada's point in the purport here to, to verse 11? Um, understanding um, 
Okay, this is the nature of the world, birth, old age, disease, and death. You have to understand that. You have to understand the negative and the positive together. And then it starts to make sense. Right? Um, there's a nice point here also, and I, I used to think like this when I was a young devotee. I was thinking, Krishna says in the Gita, there's an interesting verse in the Gita, Krishna says, basically, Krishna, if it's eternal, it'll last forever, and if it's not eternal, it won't. Then you look at the verse and say, uh, uh, yeah, uh, okay, I mean, isn't that obvious? If it's eternal, it's eternal, and if it's not eternal, it's not. That's basically what Krishna is saying in one verse. And I was thinking, okay, well, you know, that which is spirit is enduring, that which is matter is not enduring. And I was thinking, but that's just obvious. It's just like you're just making a verse of synonyms. But then I began thinking, in, in, in our world, we're trying to make things last forever that aren't. And I was thinking, oh, all Krishna's saying is, if something's, there already is an energy which is eternal, so you don't have to take the material energy and try to make it eternal because there already is another energy that is. And if you're smart, you'll understand that matter is not eternal, so stop working on it. So matter is ignorance, just understand its nature. And spirit is eternal, understand its nature. So that's, that's what Krishna is saying there, right? Simple, isn't it? Interesting, isn't it? And I thought, that verse is so simple, but it could create a revolution in the world because the so-called intelligentsia, they're sitting in their laboratories thinking, we're going to make life go on forever. Or we're going to, you know, un we're going to definitely prove there is no such thing as soul. Consciousness is not a byproduct of soul. And Krishna says, no, don't waste your time. I, you know, I already, why are you wasting your time? I already told you. There's spirit, it's eternal. There's matter, it's not. Why are you wasting your time trying to create spirit out of matter? You can't do it. And Prabhupada used to say that all the time. He used to say, don't waste your time studying this and studying that. Krishna's already explained it. So that's my analysis. And then, you know, Prabhupada gives the example to Ranya Kashipu, like, hello, Ranya Kashipu, don't you know that you have to die? No, I'll figure it out. No, you won't. Yes, I will. No, you won't. I'm God. I'll, I'll outsmart the system. No, you won't. So if Hiranyakashipu knew he couldn't outsmart the system, then he would have cultivated nescience. That would have saved him a lot of bloodshed, right? But he didn't read this verse. Or maybe he did, but he didn't apply it. So... That's the idea. You know, you're trying to become deathless. The wrong process, sorry. <laughs> That's the point of this verse, right? So we have more questions. Um yeah, there's a question in the chat. Okay. From Anna? Yeah. <laughs> I have a question out of the text, but having to do with the Shriya Upanishad. I've started reading it now, the group, and I think that philosophically is the utmost top, very flowing street. Why is it not that much used? Is Upanishad? Well, I just, because we're all Rasik, and we're not philosophers, we don't want the Upanishads. Um, <laughs> We become Rasik in our old age. I just um, gave, I did the whole Isa Upanishad. Um, we had a week of classes uh, in March in Bangalore. And I hadn't actually read Isa Upanishad in decades. I mean, the whole thing. And when I was reading it, I was thinking, you have to distribute this book in India. This is like, this is it. This is going to create a revolution. And if you read it, you really see it was really written. It's really written for non-devotees. And I mean, it's written for us also, part of the Bhakti Shastra. But so much is geared to understanding. 
uh, for, for a non-devotee. So why is it not emphasized or, well, it's emphasized in Bhakti Shastri. Um, I think also the difference, the difference now from when I was a young devotee is that when I was a young devotee, all the books were emphasized because we didn't have that many books. So that's kind of solved that problem, right? <laughs> we had first canto, we had Bhagavad Gita teachings, Lord Chaitanya. And then we had Krishna book, Nectar Devotion, and Isopanishad. So you, you could read those, you know, within the first year or six months, depending how avid a reader you are. Um, anyway, there's a lot of, uh, maybe, maybe it's a whole discussion, but just putting emphasis on reading Prabhupada's books. More. But, I mean, if you sum up the whole thing, Isa Upanishad, it really, really, it's really in a context of everything Prabhupada says in his other books. Like, hello, you're wasting time, you're going to die. Get, get, get on the program before you die. That's basically, isn't it? Basically what Prabhupada, get with the pro we say in America, come on, get with the program. Yeah, get with the program, go back to Godhead. That's what it's all about. Hare Krishna. So, um, but I think, I think when you get back out there on book distribution in South Africa, especially, or India, anywhere, this is the book. The, the invocation, that would have, you know, the invocation of follow would have completely averted the whole ecological problems we face in the world today. It's amazing, isn't it? But, Anna, I have something to tell you. I think if you take any one of Prabhupada's books and study it, you're going to think, why are they, are we not being emphasized? Why is it not emphasized to read this? This book is amazing. Why is it not used much? Well, I think it's used a lot by some devotees, maybe not everybody, but I think you'll find that in all the Prabhupada's books. You'll read it and say, wow, we need to read this book, it's amazing. <laughs> so just keep reading, that's all I can say. Yeah, I think um, I think what Anna, the point that Anna is trying to make is, you know, that this book explains a lot of these principles that can see, sometimes be bewildering, but in a very basic and practical way. So it's it's very foundational. Yeah, maybe that's the reason no one reads it. <laughs> they think it's too foundational. But you know, nothing's foundational because if you dig. If you dig deep into what Prabhupada teaches, you'll see that it's it's like an unlimited ocean, even if it seems foundation. But Anna, Prabhupada taught the devotees the Sopanisha, how to chant it in 1969. And you know what we used to do before Prasadam? You could inaugurate this if you want. We'd chant the whole thing in Sanskrit before we took Prasadam. We just all memorized it and went through it. That was, the, you know, Prabhupada was teaching us these Upanishads, so it must be important, right? It's like Bhagavad Gita, basically. The Upanishads are like the Gita, called the Gita Upanishad. Sometimes you go to the Upanishads and you see verses almost identical in Sanskrit to Bhagavad Gita. Maybe some are identical. Interesting. One thing that I noticed when reading Ishapanishad is that it kind of feels like Ishapanishad is a is a purport to Bhagavad Gita because Prabhupada quotes so much of Bhagavad Gita in the oh. purports. Yeah. I mean, Garuda Prabhu once gave a lecture that I attended at Bhaktivedanta Manor, and he said that in in traditional commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita, you, you, you study it through stages and each section of the Bhagavad Gita takes you through a stage. He said, but if you look at Prabhupada's Gita, he, he inserts the conclusion in the second chapter. He calls it the summary of the Gita. You know, it's like bhakti, surrender. You usually get the bhakti surrender more towards the middle of the end, like the last verse of chapter nine and then you get into the end, Sarva Dhamma Chaja. And he was saying that 
And so Prabhupada just like puts the essence in. And I've also read commentaries on Isopanishad and Nectar of Instruction by other Acharyas. And Prabhupada's commentaries, although taken from them, are much different in his emphasis. So that's also interesting. You could see Prabhupada's emphasis is very similar through his books, which is, which is, I think it says a lot about us, like being headed like we hear a lot. That was my conclusion. Like, you know, said, why is Prabhupada saying things that seem so basic over and over again? I said, but then my only answer was dull-headed. We're dull-headed. We need to hear it. It, it didn't go in. You know, I have layers in there, you know, gets into one layer, but I got to keep hearing it, penetrating the other layers. And maybe someday if I hear it enough, I'll, I'll get it. So you'll, you'll see that in a sense, like reading one of Prabhupada's books is like reading any of them. There's, there's a lot of similarities. And it's, it's really around focusing on this life as your launching pad for the spiritual world and minimizing everything you need for your physical maintenance so that you can maximize your energy, time, and consciousness in your spiritual life. And just then using philosophy to convince you to do that. Because Maya is going to convince you not to do that. Right? Okay. Get ahead um, in the world. Another question. Sorry? Get ahead in the um, world. Another question? Yes. Another question that we had from the group, um, kind of because we read verses 10 and 11 together, where um, it was, how do we find a balance between, um, you know, having to have a, a develop a certain amount of material knowledge and our spiritual lives? Because no one in this group is a full-time temple devotee. Everyone's either a student or they're working, and they do need to have certain amount, uh, amount of effort into their material lives. And everyone, a lot of people want to have families, but we shouldn't be overly attached. So, you know, it seems like it's a, it's a difficult um, balance to maintain. And how do we achieve this? Is it even possible? Um, yeah, definitely. Hey, possible. I'm here. Oh, I thought you got kicked out. Sorry, Rukmini. Okay, so we have one full-time temple devotee, Rukmini. <laughs> <laughs> okay, correct. You've been corrected. Okay, so... Um, not only is it possible to maintain balance, it's essential. And I would say the simplest way to answer your question is that everything should be within the context of how it's used for Krishna. And so then, you know, that material knowledge, it's no longer material because you're using it. Even if it, you're just using it to work and pay for yourself, well, what do you do with the money? You employ it to maintain a family, family or devotees, you use it for, for service, for Krishna. So, you know, one time, forget the exact context, but the situation and the devotee had to use something or do something. And he said, Prabhupada, but that's Maya. And Prabhupada said, everything is Maya, but you can use everything for Krishna, or of course, almost everything. So I think that's the idea, you know. Uh, they see the context of what Prabhupada's talking about is it's not that knowledge is bad or spiritual knowledge is good, material knowledge is bad. It's not that black and white. It's what is that material knowledge being used for? What's the goal of it? And how does that material knowledge affect your consciousness? So if you're in the academic world, if you're a student, Occasionally, you're going to come across information that's not supportive of Krishna consciousness. That's a little bit of a challenge. It's diametrically opposed philosophically. So you have to be careful. And sometimes you'll become very attached to a material subject and you'll want to, oh, I'm so interested in history, and you'll read history books instead of Bhagavatam. So that's also something to just monitor in your own life that how how uh, how much is this taking me away from Krishna and how how much am I using this for Krishna? And and I'm not in school, but I do different services 
and I have to learn certain things. And some things that I learn, I'm more interested in than others. And that can also be a, a potential temptation for me that I could, I could like doing something or like the knowledge that surrounds this service that I do it so much, I, I, I don't hear and chant as much as I should. So I think we're all in that situation, whether we're in school or not, or interest in what's going on in the world, how much time do I need to spend understanding that? So I think it's a similar situation we're all in. And if we're honest with ourselves, we just, we just kind of have to calibrate on a day-to-day -day basis how things are affecting us. And, and, and be honest about it, even though I like to do this, but it's not having a good effect on me. So maybe I need to minimize it, detach from it. And so, but, but I think generally, the general answer is, if, you, if you're very fixed on what you're doing, like you're getting education, or you're going into an occupation, and you know exactly why you're doing it, what for, and then just you enter into it in this mood of duty. I'm learning this to go into this occupation to, to either maintain myself or use this in devotional service or both. Then it's much easier. Then you don't get so affected by it. It's just this is what I have to learn to do this. Right? Right? You can study marketing, become expert at marketing. And it's just, this is material knowledge. But the whole time you're thinking, yeah, I can use this for reaching more people. So there's an immediate connection and then there's no problem. So I think the problem comes is when you separate everything and you think this is, this is Krishna conscious and this isn't, but everything is Krishna conscious for someone who's Krishna conscious and nothing's Krishna conscious for someone who's not. Even you can be looking at the deity and be in Maya, right? It's possible. Believe it or not, it's possible. So that's how I would answer that. Uh, Gurudev, I have a question. Oh, sorry, Gurudev. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was thinking about uh, uh, detachment because, uh, I mean, part of balancing, uh, well, detachment has to, to do with balancing our material life and spiritual life. But what about if we are attached to like being with our devotee friends and our families that are devotees. I mean, is it only when we're completely detached that we can go back to, to Krishna? What about that kind of attachment? I mean, because I feel like I'm super attached to my mom. Yeah. She's a devotee, but like my attachment to her is like very strong. Yeah. You have to, uh, Mm -hmm. You have to read the Queen Quinty prayer. May my attachment be drawn into you and no one else. Like the Ganges flows. So yeah. what what Quinty her in the purport there, Prabhupada said, you know, it's strange that she's praying to be detached from her sons because they're all great devotees. And Shastra says you should be attached to devotees. That's that's wanted. Attachment to devotees is the Mahat Sevam Dwara Serve the Mahatmas and you, you get liberation. So that's wanted. Uh, this, uh, the same attachment you have for things of this world, if that attachment is for devotees, then you become liberated. So that's that's half the equation. That attachment to devotees is good. But then why was Kunti praying for detachment? She was praying for detachment from the material aspects of the relationship that she thought could be unhealthy for her relationship with Krishna. So I'm, I'm attached to my wife, my family, my parents because they're devotees and because it helps us become Krishna conscious. But if I'm attached materially to get something that has nothing to do with Krishna or the sentiments are not Krishna conscious. That becomes a problem. So that's what she was praying for detachment. And then, and then Prabhupada said in the, the, in the last verse, you know, one should not be overly attached. There's, there's a point where attachment becomes detrimental, where it's, where it's like, instead of thinking of Krishna at the moment of death, I think of my family 
and how I don't want to lose them. So that's where the problem, that's, that's why this whole thing of detachment from family is there. It's not like, okay, hate your family and run away, even if they're devotees. It's, it's that the attachment cannot be an impediment. So then you have to see, is that attachment actually helping you? Or is that attachment an impediment to your bhakti? And attachment doesn't have to be, but it can be if the attachment is, is more material than spiritual. So it's something you're gonna have to evaluate yourself. And it's natural to be attached. And Prabhupada never, you know, <laughs> it wasn't like, when Prabhupada met a man, you know, the man was with his wife and kids, and Prabhupada said, so, when are you taking sannyas? When are you giving up this attachment? And he never talked like that. He was, he was always like, oh, you're all serving Krishna together? That's great, you know, what's the problem? You don't have to be a sannyasi. So, you know, if, if in your situation you say, well, this is all conducive, we're all serving together, we inspire one another, we talk about Krishna, why would you want to become detached from that? It doesn't make sense, right? But, you know, we get together and we just fall into Maya. Okay, then I have to do something else. Or if you have a death, you'll be thinking of your mother other than Krishna. Then okay, then that, that's gone a little too far. But, you know, you, you know there's a book. It's called, it's called, um, what is it called? It's a book on great hospital life. Strengthening the bonds that free us. In other words, strengthening the relationship because a good Krishna conscious relationship, a good relationship with your husband and family actually makes you more detached. Like, like for example, Rasika, I don't know if you ever heard me say this and say, let's imagine in ISKCON there was a law, nobody could get married. If you got married, you were just like, you're finished, you're out, you're not a devotee. You know, so all these devotees have been thinking, oh, I want to be Krishna conscious, but I can't get married. So what do you think would happen in a society like that? We can't even, we, we, we don't even want to talk about what would happen because we know it would be really crazy. People would be really struggling and there probably would be a lot of people uh, with boyfriends and girlfriends in private because they, they couldn't maintain it. So um, acknowledging that it would, it would be a problem, then we could acknowledge the fact that these people are married is actually helping them, right? What would women do if they couldn't have kids? A lot of women would start punching walls. They would go totally crazy. So the fact that they can have kids in a nice home and a nice husband, it's, just, it's helping them so much in Christian consciousness. So we have to see it like that. So, you know, it depends on how you relate to your family. And if there's anything that's in that relationship that's harmful to your Christian consciousness, then you work on detaching or purifying that. Is that okay? Or you want yeah, more? that's perfect. Thank you. That was very clear. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. It's a double-edged sword because we should be attached to devotees. When, then when devotees leave us, we go crazy. You know, devotees are, we're naturally attracted, but we go crazy when they leave. Okay. Are there any other questions? Rukmini, I know you always have tons of questions. I'm satisfied, thank you. <laughs> Good, now I can, so we're finished? Yeah, if nobody else has any questions, um, I think uh, there was a comment in the chat um, by Anna. So I'm lucky to have problems with my family. That's a nice point of view. <laughs> Anna, where do you live? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, this is Anna here. So I'm Greek, Greek. but I live in Italy next to uh, next to Bologna, so I, I constantly oh, yeah. listen and hear Tri Prabhu. And I also know uh, Krishna Ji, uh, your devotee. She's a very best friend of mine. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just 
making sure it was the right honor. Yeah, okay. Okay, you know so yeah, I think, oh yeah. yes, we can hear stories, definitely. I think Anna may have heard the story in class one day. I, I was reading this recently that some devotee was, I think he was complaining about his mother-in-law, like all the problems he was having. And he was telling Radna Swami and Radna Swami started laughing and he said, you are so fortunate. <laughs> so it's like, it's like, it's like anything that's bad becomes, you know, in a sense of fortune. It's just like, oh, I'm so fed up with this world and this life. Oh, the fun, maybe the funniest story ever is when one of our God brothers said, Prabhupada, can I take sannyas? And he was a leading devotee. And, you know, Prabhupada was giving sannyas to the leading devotees. And Prabhupada said, so your wife's okay with that? Yes, Prabhupada, she's fine with that. He was probably, I don't know, 35. He never even told her. He probably said, okay, you can take some else. Then, you know, the word got out and she, she, I don't know, it was in Mayapur, he was in Vrindavan, she came to meet Prabhupada. She was so upset. As we say, burnt, what do we say? Burnt, fried, toasted, uh, burnt, fried, toasted to the max. She was personification of burnt, fried, and toasted to the max. And... <laughs> She came to Prabhupada and said, and she said, Prabhupada, I hate everything and I hate everybody. <laughs> Prabhupada said, she said, oh, very good. You're making spiritual advancement. <laughs> so that's, that's how Prabhupada, that's how Prabhupada saw the reverses is, you know, when it results in that level of detachment, wow, you're fortunate. Because Prabhupada's saying, we're so entangled in this world, we'll never get out of it. And then when someone's actually getting out of it, no matter what the cause, Prabhupada's thinking, oh, this is very good. We're thinking, this is horrible. And he's thinking, no, this is good. So I, I, that was one of the funniest stories I ever heard. Anyway, and then she came <laughs> to Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, why are you giving him sannyas? Prabhupada said, I never said he could take sannyas. <laughs> Sometimes Prabhupada would do that to keep the peace. You know, this devotee said, my wife's fine. So Prabhupada said, okay. But apparently not fine. But anyway, he took sannyas. It didn't last that long, unfortunately. But anyway. Okay, so we can end now with that funny story. Yes, thank you so much for that. And um, thank you for taking your t the time to join us today and sharing your realizations with us. I'm sure everyone really benefit from, benefited from it. You're welcome. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. I hope Prabhu. I made you laugh. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you so much. Okay, I have yeah. a thank you, Prabhu. Thank you so much. I have a question. Did I make you laugh? <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, it was really dark, get this. I think I think in my last life I must have been a comedian. <laughs> but I read that if you can make Vaishnavas laugh, you make advancement. So whenever I talk, just laugh and I'll make advancement. It'll help me. <laughs> okay. Hare Krishna. Nice to see Hare you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So happy to see you. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare